Thank you for joining me on kind of a meandering journey through truffle-like fungi diversity and relationships with a, a sidestep or two into truffle-like um, fungi fruit body form evolution. And the journey begins with a memory of a short skit that someone did of me at one of the fungi mite conferences many years ago. And it went something like this. We gather around while Teresa points out truffling etiquette and safety rules regarding truffle rake. So no juggling, hygiene. And if you make a scraping, put the duff or leaf litter back over the spot where you've been raking. And then she shows us some basics on where truffles generally fruit, um, typically under the leaf litter, uh, in that top two to five centimetres, but they can also fruit down to 10 or 30 centimetres into the soil. And some hints to look for are where there are animal digs uh, and also particularly in the drier country, wherever you get leaf litter accumulation along edges of tracks or in dips in the ground, that's often where you'll get a bit of a retention of moisture. So you'll get some more likely to find uh, truffle-like fungi or truffles in those areas. In more tropical areas, that's a little bit different. And of course, you know, truffles just bubbled out of the ground when she was talking to us. So in the field, once you're there, you start looking at the macro characters and the pink with the white flesh on the outside is probably his hidden angium. The golden yellow smells like bubble gum or hubba bubba gum is uh, a very firm texture is probably Stephanospora. And, you know, then we go and the last one, little white round ball with kind of empty chambers inside is probably a Rushula relative or a Gymnomyces. And then we go back to the lab or oh, Teresa cuts them open in the field and confirms, yeah, those field IDs look pretty good. And then we go back to the lab and she gets us to do some micro and look at spores. And sure enough, the spores of the hidnangium are these beautiful little rounded balls. I call them basically Christmas baubles. There's this lovely ornamentation on the surface, really robust cones uh, that most of these uh, hidden angium species have. And the Stephanospora, very typical spores, beautiful spiny ornamentation, with this little collar or corona around the point of attachment of where the spore attaches to the basidia. Very typical. And then we look at the final one, and instead of having amyloid spore ornamentation, um, these spores are smooth maybe a tiny, very, very fine wrinkles, and they're dextranoid. So the Meltzer's or iodine solution, they're turning ready pink. And Teresa gets very excited and says, wow, that's so cool. It isn't Gymnomyces, it's Hysterogaster. And then I have to admit it could be months to years later, get the DNA data back and Hysterogaster, the ones with the pink arrows, turns out to be Discomyces, a completely different genus and well and truly embedded within the genus. But then a little bit, another five, ten years later, um, someone does some work in South America and publishes on Descolia and some truffle-like fungi that they found related to it in, from South America. And they've decided the whole lot is called Descolia. Well, it's interesting and it causes a bit of a problem in the nomenclature trap tangle because the oldest name is actually Hysterogaster, this truffle. And so rules of priority should mean that Hysterogaster should be used. So this kind of little skit that someone did of me at the Fungi Map conference is pretty much a good summary of what the last 20 years of research have been like for me with every lineage or group of truffles that I've looked at or worked on. I have to gain an understanding based on the macro and micro characters of what I think they might be related to or if they're a completely unique genus. And then with potentially the DNA 
um, adding to the story a whole other set of characters, it can totally change what that initial ID and um, hypothesis, taxonomic hypothesis was. But it's been a very fun ride and I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, learning all about all these very, very different groups and lineages. And I nearly always end up coming back to the morphology again. And when I look back at the spores of the Hysterogaster, they're quite large for a truffle-like fungus, up around the 15 to 25 microns long, um, almost smooth. And they often have this little big point at the end of the tip of the spore, which again, in hindsight, is a very, resembles very much the spores of Desco, Descomyces, which this image is of. And they have, in the case of Descomyces, um, film or cling wrap wrapping around the spore hiding the ornamentation except for this little naked peak at the end of the tip of the spore and if you think about the hysterogaster spores as being basically a naked discomyces spore then the morphology including some of the characters of hyliopelis yeah, makes sense this dna if you were really interested in knowing a bit more about that nomenclatural tangle of what's the, which name should be used for this whole group, look at um, Jerry Cooper's micro notes on the Fungal Network of New Zealand website uh, on the family systematic review of Bolbidiaceae in New Zealand. He's done a lovely job of explaining um, what that tangle is all about. I've been really fortunate. Um, throughout these time looking at all of these fungi to travel to some really lovely and amazing places, work with some fantastic people and always, almost well, pretty much every field trip and every time we make a, a do a series of collections, there will at least be one or two species or collections that are probably new species and probably it's still probably one in five collecting trips. There's a new genus or likely new genus. And I have to admit, um, doing this, setting up for this talk gave me the opportunity to remember fond memories of fungi map conferences and look back through some of the historical information and um, pre-digital slides that I had. And I miss the fungi map conferences. It was a great way to find like-minded fungi people to learn and to teach about all kinds of things, including photography, collecting, and to see some amazing places. So partly I put this in there to really emphasize the fact that local groups like QMS and the Adelaide Fungal Studies Group are really, really important ways to enjoy a, a similar vibe to what we used to have with the Fungi Map conferences and take it to um, different level and different places. Uh, it's kind of that carry on from that. Oh, and uh, please invite me to any of your long weekend camps that you might be planning to do, because I'd love to come along. So what makes a fungus a truffle or, or truffle-like fungus? Um, in this case, truffles or sequestrate fungi is a general term. It's kind of an umbrella term for any uh, mushroom fruit body or fungal fruit body that is typically fruits below ground, hypogeal, or maybe emergent, as you can see with the ammonita relative here. Um, the spore mass is completely enclosed by the peridium or pileus, and if it is exposed, it's so conv convoluted that the spores can't really go anywhere. There's also a mechanical loss of active spore dispersal in most groups. And the terms false truffles and truffle-like fungi pretty much are applied to Basidiomycota and true truffles are or truffle are considered to be relating or referring to the Ascomycota. And one of the intriguing things to me is that, as Pam Catcherside could tell you, the diversity of cup and disc fungi in Australia is really quite high. But one of the curious things is that we have a really low diversity of truffle forms of the cup fungi in Australia and New Zealand compared to what occurs in the Northern Hemisphere. There are fewer than 12 genera and approximately 40 species described uh, for Australia and New Zealand. 
And the highly diverse genus Tuber um, does not occur here naturally. It's only been introduced in truffier or truffle farms um, more recently, probably, in, you know, basically in the last 10 to 12, 15 years. And I've always wondered why there's this gap or why these those particular lineages and diversification or truffleization hasn't happened in the ascomycete lineages uh, in the same way that it has happened in the basidiomycete lineages in Australia and New Zealand. Maybe Pam Kachasaida and Camille Trong, now at the um, RBG Mel Victoria, can add to that knowledge of the diversity of those groups and maybe in a few years' time tell us, maybe answer that question of why that low diversity. So the loss of active spore discharge in most um, mushroom, bolly, uh, things that mushrooms or fungi that can produce spore prints, you get an active shooting off of the spores and dropping out between the gills or pores so you could get a spore print. In the sequestrate or truffle fungi, that mechanism is lost and the spores are actually fused to the basidia and sterigmata. And by the time you get to a truffle that is um, what they call gastroid or basically a, a completely encased with no stem tissue left, uh, the spores are often becoming more rounded and more symmetrical. And the same is actually true in cup and disc fungi in that you can, you will get a loss in many instances of actual shooting out of the spores, or if it does still occur, the spore bearing tissue is so convoluted that those spores can't go anywhere and they have to rely on animal dispersal um, or it decays in situ for that dispersal to happen. In terms of, just to give you an idea of the kind of diversity we're talking about for the basidiomycetes, for like diversity in different regions around the world, the original table was produced in a paper with Neil Bowger in 2001. And since then, we predicted, you know, what number of species might be given the number of species that we are we're continuing to describe and find. And we even I updated this in 2021. And even now, the number of genera has gone down a little bit. But that's because we're starting to put the truffle-like fungi in the same genera as they're closely related, mushroom, bolete, or or smear fungus, but the number of described species has increased considerably and continues to do so. What's also interesting is that currently the number of sequences, even barcode sequences of trough-like fungi in GenBank is really quite low, but that's also the case for a lot, most of the macro fungi in Australia. And the thing is, you know, in the last 20 years, there have been some pretty major shifts in our understanding of the diversity and evolution of the fungi, but also the truffle-like fruit body forms. And it continues to be a bit of a moving feast um, as more data becomes available. And I keep reminding my students that every taxonomic, taxonomic name that we describe or uh, put out there, it's a hypothesis and new data can change things considerably. And the DNA data has allowed us to fine tune our understanding of some of those affinities uh, within lineages where the morphology in that very reduced truffle form um, doesn't give us that many clues. It also gives us a chance to learn more about distributions, mixed communities, and plant associations. Um, but these end up coming back to morphology and ecology. So the classic is for almost every truffle, or truffle-like fungus, there is a cup, disc, mushroom, punk, or bowl eat sister. So pretty much every major lineage of mushrooms and cup fungi, there are these truffle forms. If you think of the truffles as the kind of shrub or prostrate forms, then you're not far wrong. But that convergent evolution of fruit body forms yeah, within families or even within genera means that you can't just assume that um, when you make several collections that share some of the characters that they are actually closely related or not and that can mean you also have to constantly learn each lineage more in depth as you describe each group one one example i'm using here is the weroroa laratia or pouch fungi genus and this is kind of an extreme case and the preliminary data suggested this is 
uh, fungal barcode ITSLSU data showed that species of Weraroa have evolved at least six different genera within the family Stropheriaceae. And in blue are the current names where some of these taxa or species have been moved to a new genus. But we do get these phylogenetic surprises. And this particular group of blue green uh, Loratiomyces weroa caused me no end of grief. I repeated DNA extractions and microscopy multiple times in different labs over five to ten years. Uh, because I was uncertain of my results. And it really wasn't until some research on um, related mushroom tax that was published in the last probably seven or eight years, and the DNA data became available in GenBank, uh, that I was became much more confident about my own interpretation of my own data. In this instance, the truffle-like fungal fungi, these beautiful blue-green coloration, really are no species in the genera Agrocybia or Copperopsis that have those colours. And in hindsight, going back to the morphology after uh, looking at, you know, getting the DNA confirmation is when it started to make sense. And yes, the Pileopella structure fits what occurs within Agrocybia with this hymeniform Pileopellus and the spores they're boring, they're smooth, there's not many features, but you know, they fit. And the Copronopsis, um, this is one of those beautiful ones. Steve Axford had found collections almost 10, 12 years ago, and I'd been, you know, over the years had found in the same general areas. And then a couple of the collections from New Caledonia turned out to be the same thing based on DNA. So it's an interesting distribution lowland tropical rainforest um, and on the northeast coast in New South Wales. Another phylogenetic surprise was this uh, Leda's Kundalung kid that Ian Dodd sent me. Back in 2013, uh, I described Lepiota geoginia, a truffle-like Lepiota with Elsa Valinga. And we've only had four or five collections, not many fruit bodies, very distinctive dextranoid um, spore reaction, smooth spores, thick walled, kind of a greenish tinge to the, the spore bearing tissue, tiny remnant stem, often growing in the mixed forest type of syncarbia, eucalyptus, mixed lowland rainforest. Similar area and in the Namimbo Valley Forest Reserve and Gibraltar Range currently, that's where it's known from, this Lepiota. So when Ian sent me the images and said where he'd found this particular truffle, I thought, oh, maybe it's another species of this Lepiota, um, in this Lepiota group. It wasn't until I got the DNA back, and it turns out it's a bullet, a bullitus, um, which was a real surprise, excuse me. And again, going back to the morphology, it sort of makes, makes sense with these large spores and inflated tissues. But Lepiotas also have a lot of inflated cells in their paleopolitan structure. And the Boletus cunderbunkid normally would prefer not to describe a species from your single collection, uh, but there were plenty of fruit bodies. It's rare. Turns out to be a weird relative, this related truffle, Boletus um, semigastroideus from New Zealand, with its sister taxon. I would love for more collections to be found of this particular truffle. And this northeast lowland rainforest um, around Namimba, Urimpini State Forest, Gibraltar Range, uh, Big Scrub. Is turning out to be a real hot spot of some very cool truffle like fungi, really, really strange um, taxon species. And then was lucky enough to visit the Nightcap Range in February this year uh, during the wet, um, which made it challenging, but some amazing species we found. So, one of the other, unlike many other truffle lineages I've looked at, in this case, 
the truffle fruit body form has arisen once or twice only and then rapid diversification into incredible diversity of species and the related um, taxon is paint smear fungi so this is a corticioid truffle um, has evolved into if you like it's just folded in on itself rolled itself into a ball and morphology was really macromorphology they all look golden yellowy if you're lucky a reddy orange color but micro under the microscope the incredible diversity of spore ornamentation shapes in this one it's called tetraspora because the spores um, stick together in tetrads it was really really interesting we went from a single species, Stephanospora flava, uh, to 10 new species and one new combination. What was fascinating to me was that uh, these, you know, most corticioid fungi are rotters. They're not typically thought of as mycorrhizal. And in this case, in this particular genus, it looked like there may well be some plant associations even though it's not mycorrhizal, each one of these species tends to occur in, in association with a particular um, eucalypt, nothofagus, kunzia, podocarp broadleaf forest. There's a couple of species in New Zealand that are in one of these mixed forests, but to me that was kind of fascinating. There's obviously some interesting stories there to delve into about the capacity of different species in this lineage to break down different kinds of leaf litter and is that what's um, kind of pushing that diversification of some of the radiation of species in this group. The other part of this is although we haven't confirmed it, most rotter um, fungi are more easily culturable than ectomycorrhizal fungi and I haven't actually managed to attempt it yet, but I'd love to try getting one of these Stephanosporas and see how easy it is to get it into culture uh, and maintain it in culture. Because that would be another hint to the story that it is probably um, not mycorrhizal. And so I've also been incredibly lucky to travel to New Zealand many times over the years to attend the fungal forays, um, the, and fungal network run and um, amazing again amazing people amazing group and amazing um, habitats to visit and wow diversity of fungi including truffle like fungi is incredible in New Zealand a lot of the truffle like fungi are actually emergent um, they're, they're fruiting above ground and I wonder and we've talked about this in various papers and hypothesized that partly it might be bird dispersal uh, related, but also in some ways, perhaps wetter soil. And so it's actually you're better off putting your fruit bodies at the soil surface rather than in the ground where they're possibly going to rot in situ. And just um, one of the fungal forays, which was incredible. Then you have lineages where you find basically just what you expect from what you find in the field and determine as Russia lactarius. It's one of those curious groups where it's one of the, it seems to be one of the first ones that most people learn what is a Russia, what is a lactarius in the field, and yet trying to say in words why it is that. There's a certain gestalt <laughs> that just seems to, everybody seems to click on. And yes, they all have their related. So Celeromyces is an old uh, truffle specific genus name for truffle-like. And you can see the milky juice that are related to Lactarius. And then there were several genera that were uh, related to Russia. They don't have latex, but they all have that amyloid spore ornamentation. And if you're like me, I cannot tell Lactifluus and Lactarius apart in the field, except for recognizing a couple of specific species. Um, and they're really not easy uh, to determine. Maybe in the next decade, when we have a few more species described, we'll have a better handle on what that difference is. And then this other genus, Multifurca, which has this beautiful zoned cap, which 
if you cut the, through the cat tissue, you can see zonation, those concentric rings in the, in the uh, zone. I have a, a specific soft spot for this particular lineage because this is what I can, did my PhD on. Uh, the Rushla and Lactarius relatives, truffle relatives of Australia and New Zealand. And that phylogeny on the side really is, it's got over 1200 sequences in it, about 500 of them are mine, and I've really got to publish. <laughs> but every field trip, it's one of those hyper diverse groups, just like Quaternarius is, where the truffle diversity in Australia is probably close to five species of truffleite fungi to one above ground agaricoid mushroom like species. Whereas in the Northern hemisphere, it's pretty much the reverse, five mushroom rushulas to one truffle. And that ratio in Australia may change a little bit as uh, more species of rushula and lactarius are described and lactifluors, but it seems we there are definitely a, a strong drivers in terms of evolution of these fruit body forms to go underground to protect the spore mass and to go to go truffle. And I absolutely adore the amazing array of ornamentation types that you can see. And unfortunately, there are an awful lot of little round white balls for these particular this particular lineage, particularly in the Rushula. And I'm likely to try and run another um, online help me find names for 20 white round white balls, I think, um, in the near future. Again, some different habitats, pretty much wherever you can find eucalyptus, uh, so Myrtaceae, Alocasiorina, some acacia, Nopophagus, um, you are likely to find syncarpias, you could, you're likely to find uh, truffle-like fungi. And it's been fascinating getting into these different habitats. So a lot of my work is also detective work, figuring out what the early historical material and names are available and whether what I have is new or not. It's one of the few times I don't lament the fact that there are so few early mycologists and continue to be so few mycologists um, because there's far less digging that has to happen here than in a lot of places overseas. So I'm sure Fran can tell you and certainly has talked about some of her findings with Merasmus. We have that same issue here. So a lot of the earlier collections um, and specimens were sent to overseas herbaria and mycologists to be described. And they were often, you know, someone who was lucky, if they were lucky, they saw a painting or a drawing and maybe some notes. And back in the 1850s to 1870s, they pressed the, you know, the fungi like plants. So they went in a plant press and got sent slow boat, leaky boat. And so it's actually pretty incredible how many actually survived that trip. Um, so as you can see from this particular uh, collection, not much remains of some of these, of these samples. We've also got the illustrations that these, um, in this case, Berkeley and Massey drew from what they saw on the, on the piece of paper. And they don't look, you know, they look a pretty good representation of the, what we find as fresh material for these particular ones. Um, one of the things about it is it can take sometimes a long time. And these two species, Cicotium melanosporum and Cicotium coarctatum, are the first truffle-like fungi to be described from Australia, now from Western Australia. And it wasn't until 2012 that uh, they finally found their final, well, <laughs> their final resting place for the moment in terms of until someone else comes up with a different hypothesis. And so it was been fascinating to discover that in the genera Agaricus and Macrolipiota, there are truffle-like forms and in chlorophyllum in Australia. Diversity within Agaricus is somewhere around the 12 to 15 species. 
what I found fascinating when I started work on this group was realizing that when they're young, um, you can sometimes see a little bit of what looks like like tissue, you know, holding the, the spore mass together, very convoluted. But by the time they are mature, they're becoming powdery. And in this whole lineage, if you go back to things like lycoperdons and the puffball, some of the puffballs started out powdery, became gilled in agaricus chlorophyll or microlobiota, and then became powdery again. So there's some very, very interesting um, evolution and transitions that happened in this lineage that I'd love to investigate or have a student investigate further um, to look at some of the genes that might be switched on or off that might, hey, maybe if we can make this happen in the lab, don't know. What I also found fascinating is that the majority of these truffle-like forms in this lineage occur in arid country and semi-arid country. Not a single one was, has been found so far in wetter um, forest and habitat types. And so if you're out in arid country and you think you've found puffballs and you have the temptation to kick it, it may well produce a puff of spores because it might be dry and powdery. But do have a look, maybe cut one or two of the younger ones open to see if you can see that highly convoluted chambered texture of the spore bearing tissue. If there's remnant stem tissue, and you can see here, then it's possible what you have is actually a truffle like agaricus or Macrolepiota. And although this particular species, um, Agaricus colpeteorum, from Ned's Corner in Victoria, is not that big, I mean, it can get to maybe 50 mils diameter. Some of those other species of the Agaricus truffles um, are the same size as a normal Agaricus, so they could get up to 70 mils diameter across the cap. They're not small. Have a look the next time you're out in arid country. One of the other ones that came about with this highly reduced fruit body form, um, where there's basically lost any stem tissue, um, it might be a teeny indication, if you're lucky, of a tiny remnant, like a little basal pad, to give you an indication of what's you know, the base and what's the top. And no gill structure, it's all just highly convoluted chambers. In this case, there was a species called Alpova clelandii, described by Beaton, Pegler and Young in the 1960s. And at the time, they weren't using melt as or iodine solution very often. So it wasn't until a bit later that we discovered that if you put the tissues of this particular truffle into iodine solution, the, the, it turns the um, spore bearing tissue in the pileus te uh, texture is actually amyloid and so it turns violet uh, and has tiny smooth little spores. So 2008 we had uh, DNA from four collections which they all had amyloid trauma and they all seem to be this thing of the So in 2017 sequenced another 30 collections and thought we had maybe three different species. Turns out they're three different genera, all looking incredibly, incredibly similar. Um, they come out in very, very different, um, associated with very, very different folate genera. And in the 2015 to 2020, there was an explosion of folate genera, Bolicales genera, um, lots of lots of new species, no genera and uh, families, uh, lineages described. So current project is to try and sequence a lot more of these, of more genes, and uh, try to get some better support or placement of where these particular species belong. And it's looking like this particular one we're calling Gen of one but it may well be it's actually a swill Ellis. Um, this other one is bullet turning out to be 
closely related to Nigra Belita species, but there's poor support, so we're not sure if that's where they will end up. And amylotrauma, amyloid trauma, is um, was described this year for two species. And um, again, fascinating. And all of these species, all of these collections are mostly southern, but they go up into New South Wales and certainly WA and probably do occur in northern, in Queensland and northern Australia as well. So again, love to see more of this. And then we get, again, this incredible diversity in the stinkhorn genera. This paper was published in 2021, uh, Naveed Dahoudian, myself and various others. And we sequenced a whole bunch of different um, collections of what we called hysterangium. It tends to have a rubbery, cartilaginous, gelatinous, um, spore-bearing tissue, greenish in the center, white outside, may stain pink, lots of rise of fine rhizomorphs, and then related groups. In this case, this is a whole family, Mesophiliaceae, called in Castorum, Fusi Castorum, related groups that is endemic to Australia. What it turned out was that Hysterangium sensu stricto, as in the type species, is actually from the US and the genus. And now we're having to just go back and describe, if you can see these blue stars. Um, there's at least three genera where we have called it hysterangium, but it has to have a new name. And in fact, the, if you look at the paper that we wrote, there's probably eight genera that will have, that were called hysterangium that will have to have new names. So it was an incredible increase in, um, we discovered about 25 new provisional genera that are in the process of being described. Um, so it's not enough to know the names of these truffle-like fungi and which um, lineage they're related to. I also want to understand what they're doing in the environment and the impacts of maybe of their loss or if we're able to restore uh, them to the environment and whether or not understanding some of that ancient history or evolution or transition of these forms could provide some answers to, to help us with these ecological kinds of questions about climate change, aridification, loss of dispersal agents. And so a few years ago, I presented uh, some of this data at a conference. Then, and I still have this, I'm still of the same mind that there are two broad patterns of evolution of the fruit, this truffle fruit body form. This is the most common uh, pattern found in most agaricales, russulales, cortinariales, in which you have multiple parallel events where you have an agaricoid or mushroom relative that has produced different truffle-like forms many, many times over. Um, and almost all the truffles are kind of the terminal, the end points within the each clade. And it's very rare find a clade where you have truffle-like forms that are this highly reduced form that has an ancestor that is truffle what this kind of intermediate form and leads back to um, a mushroom instead it seems to you know we seem to be either missing some of these intermediate forms or it's a very rapid change that seems to be able to happen and if you look here, you can see the timing of when most of these truffle-like forms in the Russulales arose is probably typically less than 20 to 25 million years ago, based on these estimations at the time. The second main pattern appears to be mostly in the Boletes, Boletales and um, the Stinkhorns, Phalele lineages, where you had an event where either have an event where there's sequestration event and then rapid incredible deradiation of truffle-like forms or it was basically truffle-like the whole time um, and that seems to be at the tips you end up with stable genera monophyletic clays um, of tr purely truffle-like genera um, 
it's going to be a molecular clock linear uh, estimation of when some of these uh, lineages in the stinkhorns arose 130, 60 to 130 million years ago. And that sort of makes sense uh, when you think about that relationship with insect, potentially insect dispersal, and how long the insects have been around versus small marsupials as dispersal agents. This is just an example of one of these, um, closer look at one of these bolatoid uh, radiation events within the, the uh, Lexanellum, Chamonixia, and Octaviania clades. So these are all truffle like, mushroom truffle like. And there's this event and then radiation um, into multiple, multiple species. Just a version, this is a, we use this in the Shidi et al. Um, paper showing the timing of when eucalypts about 30 million years ago um, emerged in Australia, or diversified. The red arrows are when different sort of pulses of um, diversification of truffle-like fungi occurred. And then this blue arrow is where the um, toteroids, the small mammals that have um, actually changed their gut physiology for gut fermentation so that they can actually eat purely a very high fungi diet. Now, if you look on here, the um, truffle-like stinkhorns, mesophiliaceae family is around 50 million years ago and then um, much further back into the 120 or so years ago for the others. So it's interesting when you start thinking about what factors might influence that push to becoming truffle-like. I've also been very lucky to travel to Kangaroo Island in South Australia and spend quite a bit of time with the Pam and David Catcherside, Helen Vono and various other people collecting truffles and fungi. And um, before and after several of the major fires, I have not myself been back after this last really big event, but Pam and David Catcherside have, and there's some regeneration happening. Uh, the equivalent of there would be the Fraser Island fires, I'm assuming. One of the partly related to the trying to figure out what's going with the truffle-like evolution and uh, transition to truffle-like fungi form, we're with a group of various collaborators. We are working with uh, the Joint Genome Institute in the US, JGI. We collected 12 pairs of a truffle-like and a related mushroom in the same lineage, or attempted to. And we're going with getting genomes and RNA, and we're basically looking for a needle in the haystacks, um, trying to figure out what those things, how it differentiates from a mushroom, which the cap expands versus a truffle where it doesn't expand, stipe, which elongates and, and expands, whereas in the truffle like it, it doesn't or doesn't go far. And then that complete uh, convolution of the hymenium form. And, you know, the hypothesis is that it's in a, these are adaptations to changes in climate. Um, whether or not we'll be able to find those needles in the haystacks is unsure. This is just to give you a bit of a sense of, you know, those cocktail flags you could see in the ground down here are basically pointing to these tiny little primordia. And what we're trying to do is collect tissue uh, before stem elongation or initiation has started and before spore bearing tissue has started, intermediate phase and then mature tissue. Uh, to try and see uh, whether when genes are switched on and off during that uh, expand, the maturation process. We're about two thirds of the way through on this, and so hopefully in the next couple of years there should be some others. So really no end in sight um, because <laughs> there's so many more of these truffle-like fungi out there. Um, to find, describe, exclaim over, be fascinated by, to try and figure out what they're doing in the environment, whether or not they're mycorrhizal or not. Um, I really haven't touched on the Cortinarius related species very much at all, but the incredible diversity in that lineage. This photo on the right here uh, is a 
endopaxillus or now would be ostropaxillus relative uh, truffle that we found last year. It's a new species and we've made a second collection of two collections this year so that's another one that'll get described soon. And then a whole range of these very reduced forms of bowl leech that um, yeah lots and lots of species to describe. So why haven't we put Ivan, I suggested or proposed some of the truffle like fungi species for fungi map, you know, on their 100 species to find kind of thing. Partly it's, I don't really want to release 100 people out there with truffle rakes um, digging up truffles. So if you are going to go out and look for truffle like fungi, a single fruit body does not make a collection. That's true of pretty much any um, fungi collection but particularly with some of these truffle-like things. Replace the, if you've made a scrape, replace the leaf litter and clean. You know, hygiene is incredibly important when you're moving, um, and particularly because you're moving around in the soil. And these images of the bandicoot deans and the echidna, if you're walking through an area and raking a little bit here and there, you know, it's basically almost mimicking what some of these um, small mammals and um, echidnas can do in a, in a habitat. It's when you get, you know, 10 people raking in a small area that it, it's really not what you're trying to, um, it's not mimicking the small mammals, definitely. So how can you help? <laughs> There's always one of these slides in there. Um, Please use iNaturalist, put photos up and let me know if you think you've got some truffle-like fungi. I'll try to do my best at um, putting a genus name at least based on the photos, particularly if you're able to cut one in half to show what the interior looks like. If you have spore, are able to do microscopy, even better, because that also helps. But in terms of, um, so in terms of truffle-like fungi, anything boletoid, some of the pale colored lactarius relatives and lactofluous relatives and particularly with this wet weather out in arid areas look for some of these um, truffle like agaricus chlorophyllum macroepiotas um, matt barrett does have a chlorophyllum from northern territory somewhere or in north queensland that um, really love to see described because it's the only known species from australia in, in the genus chlorophyllum and for agaricoid fungi, um, anything lactarius, lactifluous looking um, has these zoned, highly zoned cap, um, and almost thin kind of tissue. We have one species, one collection that we know of from um, Queensland that Sapphire McMullen Fisher made, and it is a very strange beast. So would absolutely love to see images and or collections made of anything that fits these groups. The other one is I'm writing a series of papers on exotic fungi introduced to Australia. So we've done the Lactarius and uh, Rushula first round. We're doing Amanita at the moment, and the next one is probably Agaricus. Um, one of the big gaps is we really have very little information about what's occurring with the pines and exotic trees in Queensland and Northern Territory. And having traveled around the Cardwell area with Fran, I know there are a lot of pine plantations up there. Anyway, it would absolutely happy to be, um, if you've got an interest to help you co-author or write a, a description for something like Fungal Planet, um, yeah, so please contact me if you're interested and just uh, acknowledge the, all the people who have helped um, get me to where I am now and I hope that I get to enjoy working with a whole bunch more people in the future. And that's the end. Um, how many truffles make a good collection from Vanessa Ryan? Um, yeah, it's very similar to if you have a small mushroom or bowl eat. So typically you want a minimum of four to 10 fruit bodies if you can.
Very good. And I was um, wondering about other critical information to get in the field. I imagine because um, truffles generally exploit the secret of scent that we would need to record the smell of the truffles in the field. <laughs> Uh, yes, smell is would be is really is can be helpful. However, we all know that um, odors. If you you know ask ten people in the room what it smells like, they'll get different, slightly different answers. Um, some of them like the Stephanospora, the bright golden yellow one that I showed the image of, has a really distinctive smell of nail polish remover plus sweet. Um, so some of the smells are really quite obvious. Colour, texture, shape, um, size, and yeah, smell if you, you know, think you can put something, even a broad category um, is useful. Do you find that the smell uh, is preserved with, after the specimen is dried or it diminishes or disappears? Now, that's a good question. Um, for most of the Russula, Cortinarius, for most species, no, it does not persist. They're volatile, so they don't persist. But some of the boletes and certainly the Stephanospora, uh, Fusi castorium, if you open up the packet, you, you know, 10, 20 years later in the herbarium, I get a waft of it and I'm like, ah, I know what that is. <laughs> Excellent. My advice always to try and remove the subjectivity of smell uh, in the field is to hand it around and have everyone have a sniff and don't tell each other what they smell. And then after you've all had a smell, then give your answers. And that kind of, you're not suggesting a smell to anyone. Yeah. We yeah. use in the field for smell, but um, it can be a subjective thing, I understand. Talk about uh, underground fungi and you're saying, you know, you're, you're raking things, but how... So I'm a complete newbie and know pretty much nothing about anything. So um, if I was wandering around and thinking maybe there could be truffles there, what are the signs that might say, oh, here might be an area that you do a little bit of digging in? Do you look for the animal signs of digging and say, oh, that might be worth it? Or do you look at the, the other things that are growing in that area and say, oh, this might be a decent area to, to dig around in? Or mm. what's your advice? Mm. Uh, yep, so animal digs, uh, diggings is usually an indication there's something around. Sometimes it's because the animals are actually after the um, insects that have uh, put their grubs into the truffle or baby button mushrooms, um, mm. and that's what they're actually after. But the other thing is, I have to admit, I do just an awful lot of digging, a lot of you know moving of the leaf litter, and uh, I look for where there's patches of mycelium. Um, again, places where there's likely to be, if there's another mycorrhizal mushroom or bolete nearby, that's often, if you're finding more than one different species or even genus of fungi in the same sort of general one to two, three, four meters, I tend to have a look, um, at least in Southern Australia, my experience has been that sometimes there are possums have their own, um, they have uh, uh, poo spots, poo stations where they tend to drop their fecal pellets pretty consistently. And so that's often they're out there munching on a range of things and then they drop their fecal pellets and that just provides a, a really rich inoculum of a lot of different spores, of a lot of different things in that one patch. And so I, I often look for possum trees um, in the case of um, bandicoots or where there's bandicoots around in the, in the habitat. Again, I'd be looking for diggings and anywhere that you see lots of uh, a spot where there's a lot of fecal pellets around. Um, I tend to look around probably not directly at the base of the tree, um, but nearby within the root zone. Thank you. Susie? Um, you had, you showed us the, the, um, the, the macro uh, mushrooms, the macro lepiotas and things and chlorophyllum. And you said they're out in the desert areas mostly. Do you find a lot of different species out there when you go out or do you just find some very limited specific species? 
Um, so that was uh, very much targeted at the truffle-like forms of agaricus and chlorophyllum and, and macrolepiota. Um, that's an interesting one because looking through, when I went through all the herbarium records, it was very patchy. So there were, you know, there were 20 collections from 30 years ago and then nothing for 10 years. And then another, you know, patch of over a two to four year period, a lot of collections and then nothing for 10 or 15 years. And when I went back and looked at the rainfall records, that's what, um, clued me in is that some of these La Nina and rainfall events in those arid countries seem to be um, a kickoff, not just for the truffle agaricus, but also other mushrooms in those kind of drier habitats. And I don't know, I haven't been out into the more, you know, the more arid country in the north, um, but certainly Victoria and, East, and uh, Western Australia and South Australia a lot of the mushrooms actually push up the soil, but never actually really come above ground. Um, and so you'll get this push up of the soil just enough so that the gills are above the soil surface high enough that wind can go past and take the spores, but they're reducing their exposure to desiccation, I'm assuming. So it's an interesting time to go out and have a look uh, in terms of diversity. Yeah. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. We also have a question from Vanessa. Do truffles fruit at certain times of year or all year round? Whenever you start seeing, uh, I'm going to say this so for Mediterranean southern collecting and uh, cool wet winters, uh, typically we start looking in autumn and whenever you start seeing um, the boletes and rushula and lactarius, starting to fruit uh, is within a week or two after that, you'll start getting truffles. Um, in the more tropical areas, it seems to be similar. Um, and it's been interesting because I've done a, I've, I spent a year starting in, in Queensland and Northern Territory in, Jan, in end of January, February, March, and then came back in April and May and we were finding incredible diversity in different things during those periods and then just kept going down the east coast new south wales victoria tassie all the way around and basically just kept going april may june july by the time we got to south australia it was june july august wa was june july august so very much in the the autumn i guess i would call it there's more when you get the greatest diversity in biomass. David? Time for a question. Yes. Um, yeah, so as a lay person, when I think of truffles, I normally think of the edible, delicious truffles. Um, and I was wondering, given that there's clearly a lot of diversity in the morphology of the truffles, is there also a similar diversity in terms of the physiological effects on, on humans like there are with mushrooms? You know, there's psychedelic mushrooms, there's toxic mushrooms, there's also edible mushrooms. Is that the same with truffles as well? Oh, good question. Um, so because each, you know, the truffle-like forms are related to the different agaric mushroom bolete relative lineages, they tend to have the same chemical properties as their close relatives. So yeah, highly variable in terms of what chemicals they produce and whether or not they're toxic or not. If you think about the number of truly toxic species of mushrooms and bowl eats, it's really quite small. Um, and the same is true for the truffle like things. The other interesting thing is in Australia, at least there's very strong adaptive pre evolutionary pressure to be um, eaten and by a, a mammal um, and move to have your spores dispersed. So in a couple of lineages where we know there are toxic relatives, like in the Amanita phylloides or um, where there are amatoxins present in some of those lineages or clades, the related truffle has lost those chemicals, has lost the toxin. Thanks.
Any other questions? Yes, Susie? Uh -huh. um, I understand that um, we can find our truffle-like fungi at various depths. Um, I'm led to believe as deep as 800 millimetres. Is that fact or is that fairy tale? <laughs> um, the majority um, tend to fruit in that top two to five centimetres of kind of organic soil mulch kind of area. Because that's where the they might the majority of them are mycorrhizal, so they tend to be where the fine roots are likely to be the the densest and most active. However, um, in some forest and habitat types, typically and particularly, you can see sometimes animal digs, bandicoots. You'll see that cone going down 10, 15, 20 centimeters. They're after some of those truffles that uh, do fruit quite deep down into the soil. So. I think the maximum depth that I've actually dug <laughs> deliberately to looking to see how far, I, you know, how deep these things would fruit in some instances is probably about 35 to 40 centimetres. But I have had one um, farmer who was deep tilling a particular field in Victoria, and he was using um, a, a particular piece of machinery that was churning a meter deep into the soil and um, in that instance he brought in a whole bunch of uh, this particular family and these are filiaceae truffles that he'd found you know down in the bottom of the the hole kind of thing so at least a meter deep if not more and uh, but that's about the maximum i've ever ever heard of anybody um, finding truffle like fungi thank you Richard? Hey, when you spoke on uh, culturing before, how would that be useful to you other than saprophytic or mycorrhizal? What other questions would that answer? Um, so that was in relation particularly to that Stephanospora lineage. Um, partly uh, because of it has these very strong chemical odors as well. There's some interesting chemistry going on. Uh, so it would be useful, I think, to get it into culture uh, to look for some of those compounds. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that that golden colour, if you open up a herbarium packet of archival paper after 20 years, the pigment has leached into the paper and the paper has turned that same golden colour. Again, I'd be very curious about pigments um, for that in terms of chemistry. Uh, because it seems to be light fast as well. So that could be an interesting compound. In terms of the ecology more side of things and function uh, of the and that particular lineage, it would be supporting the idea that it's not mycorrhizal if you can get it into culture easily and maintain it in culture. Um, most mycorrhizal, ectomycorrhizal fungi you can maybe get into culture, but they really don't like to be in culture for very long. And it's they're very typically slow growing. Um, and then there'd be some potential. I'd be interested in, I, in that tree I showed you. There were some very definite um, forest type associations with the, each species seemed to be almost unique to either eucalyptus, nothophagus, Alocasurina. Um, so again, some interesting chemistry potentially going on there, uh, trying to understand why there was this rapid diversification um, of species or speciation in that lineage and tying it back to what compounds or what kind of leaf litter some of these um, particular species could actually decompose or break down. Okay. Some interesting questions you could go through. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Um, Tammy, another question? Uh, I just, uh, you know, you've got some fungi that can glow uh, or fluoresce. Is wandering around at nighttime helpful, you know, <laughs> that um, might sort of make their appearance a little bit more known at nighttime? Um, that's an interesting one. There's no, none of the truffle like species that have been found so far 
um, are related to lineages that have the bioluminescence. So there's no Omphalotus truffle, none of the Mycenas, uh, so far. However, the tropics, subtropics, lowland rainforest is where you're going to find them, if they are going to be around, I think. Um, the only interesting thing is that beautiful blue uh, Copronopsis that um, described from New Caledonia and Big Scrub um, area was in New Caledonia, our local guide, um, Kanak Guide, I asked him, you know, oh, do you know where we can find more of this? And he says, oh, we have to come out at night because it glows in the dark. Now, Steve Axford says he's never seen that Australian version collections glow in the dark, but it could be interesting um, to see whether or not that's possible or not. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, any more questions? No, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. That's been really terrific and we've thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for having me. And, uh, this is just a very brief show and tell. And um, it's something of interest, particularly because it was something that um, Teresa and I found when we went up north last year. Uh, it's one of my group the Merasmus, and the name is Levalianus. Now, that's not a name that I've put on it. It's a name that was attributed to this a long time ago, described back in 1847 by Berkeley, but he gave it the wrong genus, and Patouillard corrected that to Merasmus Levalianus. And you might say, where on earth does Levalianus come from? And um, by the way, this is a picture of the channel between Cardwell and Hinchinbrook Island, and that's where we found it. So the name Levalianus is in honour of Joseph Henri Levalle, who was a French mycologist back in the 18th century. century, and most people haven't heard of him. However, he is a very underappreciated and very important mycologist because he was the first man to describe the cells that produce the spores, which we saw in um, Teresa's presentation, those spores that were formed on the ends of the cell. And he, this, he first coined the name Basidium. And uh, before that, everyone had thought that all cells were produced in sacs, as in the ASCII, sacs like called ASCII. And so he proposed these two big groups of fungi, the basidiomycetes and the ascomycetes. So we can thank him for that understanding of those two huge lineages of uh, um, fungi. So that's the name of the man. And, and this is where we found this particular Merasmus. It was in um, coastal forest, right on the edge of the, um, the sea. And, and you can, can see there that bridge was over the little stream which goes straight out into the channel. The, the, um, the whole land would be inundated from time to time. And, and the, the sand dunes were um, quite low. It was all full of mosquitoes as you would expect. So this is the fungus itself. Now it's very obvious, it's not some tiny little brown mushroom, it's quite bright. And, and there were plenty of them. They occurred in these big bunches, as you can see there, although sometimes they were on their own, just singly. There were a lot of dead um, stems or finished spent stems, and also a few um, rhizomorphs, the, the white and grey ones were rhizomorphs, although that wasn't very prominent there. Now, when I first saw it, I wasn't even sure that it was a Merasmus. In fact, for the whole year since we were up there, I thought, mm, I'm not too sure what this is. And then finally got to doing some DNA on it and found that, in fact, it fitted. 
right in with Merasmus. So here are some more of its features. The stem is free. The gills are free, I mean, and from the stem. And there were quite a lot of um, gills there. The young cats had these little knobs on the top, which means they're called umbo or umbonate, which become flat as the um, fruit bodies mature. When I looked at it under the microscope, it had some really bizarre cells. And uh, as um, somebody has said, it looks like you've blown up one of those little balloons and twisted it into um, different segments. And that is typical of this particular group of Merasmus. The polypellus, for those who are new, are the cells that occur on the cap surface. And the, um, the other cells on the bottom slides are the ones on the gill surface. So when I did the DNA, there's the family tree over on the, the left-hand side of the screen. And as with any family tree, there are relatives and there are very distant relatives and there are ones that you would say are almost hardly related at all. But this group fell within the whole family of Merasmus and um, they were together with their close relatives from Cameroon, India and Thailand. They were up to 99.3% similar, uh, which says they are the same species. So when I looked at uh, the descriptions from these from overseas, the ones on the left I thought were interesting because the stems look very similar to ours. The ones on the right, not quite so obvious in that regard. But um, the interesting thing in, within Merasmus is that Lavaliani is a, sep, is a section within Merasmus which has only one species in it. And um, I hadn't even bothered to look at that. One because they'd all come from Africa and Asia until now. Brad, what was that uh, uh, chronosecret just above that, that quite? The 794. One. Uh, that was. Uh, hmm, where did that chronosecret come from? It is one that in my chronosequi tree is not actually Crinosequi at all. It's, it's one, one of many that are called Crinosequi, but are not. I forget. I should know, but I've forgotten. That's yeah. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> I should know it, but I've forgotten. Um, <coughs> but it's, it's interesting because, because it's, it's, a, it's a sister clade and uh, it is quite it's exact. close. It's not that close. It looks like it's closer than it is in that <laughs> So this is where they've been found before throughout Africa, in India, Sri Lanka was where it was first described, Thailand, the Philippines and Malaysia, and now Australia. The one over in Mexico was described, but has never been sequenced. So we don't know if in fact it is the same, um, or if this is a, a paleotropical species with an extension into Australia. So, so when you look at this, this, this is what uh, makes it this particular species. There are the large fruit bodies from Erasmus, 10 to 36 millimetres, deeply pigmented. So they're, they're, they're bright things and you're not going to miss them. Reddish brown, orange brown, umbernate, meaning they've got that little knob on top. Free gills, there's no collar. And they're, they call it subdistant. I would call them from Erasmus, fairly close. They have thick, tough, wiry stems and incitatious, meaning there's no mycelium at the base. They just go straight into their substrate. And the stems are quite long, 25 to 60 millimetres and a millimetre wide. So that's, for a Merasmus, that's quite a thick stem. They can be cestopose, growing in clumps, and occasionally they have rhizomorphs. They're the threads of mycelium. When you look at them under the microscope, they have these, um, what are called sickest type broom cells. Those are the ones that look like the balloons with a few broad, knobby, obtuse digits like fingers. 
And also, sometimes they have smooth wall cells, and there's no staining and no color change when you put the um, um, melts on them, which is an iodine stain. So that is a species which hasn't been found in Australia before, and it's uh, one that I think we should all people look out for. It may be that it has just been brought into Australia from overseas. Maybe it's been here for a long time and nobody's found it. And um, one to keep your eye out for. Thank you. Fran, is it? Yes. Do you think it only grows in, in areas where there's some sort of salt water? No, I don't. It seems to me that that was quite by chance that we found it in, uh, in that area because when I looked through all the descriptions in other places, none of them mentioned coastal habitat. It was always just forest. Yeah. Fran, do you think that they seeing the stem went straight down into the wood, which was usually the substrate. Do you think it uses beetle um, holes to? I don't. I think it's probably a, just a decomposer like okay. other Erasmus and that it's just um, um, doing its normal thing, not, not growing out of beetle holes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions?